Okay, Adam the Tutor, thank you for coming on Learning Never Stops. Uh, thanks for thanks for coming here. You're teaching to, uh, physics on tutorocean.com, and uh, you're accepting students now to teach them over the summer. And uh, it's back to school season, so I would like to get to know you and ask you some questions. Is that all right? Okay, sounds sounds like a good plan. Great, Adam. So, uh, what are your interests? So right now I'm doing my PhD in physics and my interest specifically uh, right now is in generating uh, models directly from data using machine learning. So that's it's sort of like the where math and physics and programming meet. Um, so that's really my current interest right now, but I have a lot of different interests. Um, I love learning languages. Um, I've learned Spanish uh german i'm learning uh russian ukrainian stuff like that um and uh also just a really big pure math guy um i discovered that back in like 2018 really love pure math i used to hate it because i didn't understand it and it, you know it's always you always hate those things that you don't understand but then when you understand you're like oh this is actually a lot of fun okay i shouldn't have written this off so you know it's good stuff <laughs> That's great. Well, so you actually went from hating pure math to loving pure math. That's really fascinating. Yes. yes. And and I think it was just because the reason why I hated it was because no one had ever explained how to do a proof. So I hated doing proofs. But now doing proofs are fun. It's like a good challenge. You know, it's like, oh, I wonder how I would prove that. I don't know. Let's 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 see what's what's going to happen here. And uh, for the parents who may be watching, what is it about proofs that students like yourself have found difficult <clears throat> and, and can parents expect their own kids to have problems like learning proofs? Yeah, so the, the problem is, and, and usually students either encounter this in like a linear algebra or a calculus setting, uh, linear algebra is very proof heavy. Uh, calculus, uh, usually when you start doing epsilon delta proofs, um, you're like a fish out of water because proofs are like no math that, you know, say maybe like the typical high school level or even the typical, you know, community college uh, course really covers. Um, Cause in order to successfully do a proof, you need to understand things like implications, um, you know, by conditionals, uh, how logic works because logic is really the language that math is predicated on. And if you don't understand that, uh, uh logical statements may not make sense to you for example a implies b um you have to understand the truth table of a implies b in order to successfully use a statement like that and that's not something that is typically covered in say for you know when when you're a scientist or an engineer and you're taking these math classes so would you recommend that a parent like get a tutor for their kid? Because this sounds like really hard and coming out of high school, the students may just have a terrible time learning this on their own. Would a, oh, getting a tutor be a good idea? Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, I think one, one of the biggest things that really would have helped me going through those classes in those particular subjects is had I had someone to sit me down and explain, okay, in order to properly prove this, you need to use this proof, this proof structure. And here's the reason why this actually shows that this thing is true. That would have really cemented my understanding a lot more because now I kind of have to look back and be like, oh man, I wish someone would have explained this to me, you know? <laughs> so, yep. Yeah, I, I hear frustration in your voice. It, it sounded like you really could have used a tutor when you first started in 2018? Uh, well, so with, with the pure math, um, it, it was a lot of learning. I think by that point, I had matured to, 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 get the, to get the math material. But definitely back in like 2012, when I was going through these classes, yeah, I mean, like I said, for epsilon deltas, for a lot of linear algebra, I, I went through the motions of, okay, I know this is what I need to do to prove it, but I have no idea why this works. I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm just sitting there copying what my teacher did essentially. And, um, it, it just, I really like to understand things. 
Uh, I think most people really like to understand things when you don't get that level of understanding. It just kind of feels like you're, you're, you're cheating somehow. You're not, you're, you're being deprived of something or maybe not you're cheating, but you're being cheated somehow. And so that's really where I think a tutor really would have helped me in that particular area is like, they could have sat me down and like, okay, look, this is what you're really doing. Um, and I've kind of had to sit some of my students down and be like, okay, this is what your professor is doing. This is why they're doing that. And I think that that really helps because then the student's like, oh, okay, I, I get it. Okay, this, this feels better now. So mm-hmm. it's not just about, you know, it's one thing to know something up here, but it's another thing to know something in here, right? So, mm-hmm. you know, that's, that's a lot of times what, what, uh, what gets missed. That's great. So that was pure math. Could I uh, switch gears to physics? What do you yeah. think is the key to learning physics, in your opinion? Lots of passion. Um, so a, a lot of students, and, and I know uh, I've tutored them, I've TA'd them, a lot of students, they have to take physics. It's not something that they're necessarily passionate about. Um, and I think my biggest piece of advice to them is, try to find something in physics that will apply to something that you're really interested in. For example, if you're really interested in being a data analyst, you don't necessarily care about conservation of momentum or, you know, uh, Newton's, you know, second law or anything like that. But you might really care about doing data analysis. You might really care about, okay, what are the tools that I can use to analyze a data set? And so when I, for, for example, when I TA'd, um, uh, the physics labs uh, at my university, I always made sure to put an emphasis on real life skills. Okay, can you, what can you conclude from this data? And then of course, you know, because it is a physics class, I do have to, you know, include some physics, but I really made the emphasis more on like, okay, what does this data analysis tell you Mm -hmm. just in terms of the data? You know, let's, let's, We'll, we'll add in the physics afterwards, but like, how can you use, say, like Excel or something like that to create, you know, a linear regression? What does the R squared value tell you? Uh, you know, or if you're doing like a log log regression, what does that mean? If R squared is one, what does that mean in terms of this data to this relation that we're plotting? So really just kind of abstracting it to like pure math and stuff like that. Um, so that's really the key is, you have to find something you're passionate about and really go after it. And if you're not really passionate about the thing that you're doing, try to find something that you enjoy doing within it, because that'll really make the experience a lot more fun and a lot more, you'll retain more because you'll remember it was a good memory. So. Awesome. I've got a fun question. If you could do anything without failing, what would you do, Adam? Um, make a million (laughs) dollars. No. um, So, uh, you know, I I think maybe, maybe a better question would be something like, you know, if, if you had like, if you had a lot of confidence, what would you do? Because a lot of times people don't do things because they're not really confident because they're like, oh, what if I fail? What, you know, what if I, you know, what if everyone laughs at me? You know, what, you know, uh, in fact, a lot of students won't ask questions because they're really, really afraid of oh well this is a stupid question people you know Mm. of course everyone else knows it what you know I'm not going to ask this because I'm going to look dumb Mm. so really I think it's it's a confidence issue and what I would definitely do like if I had like unlimited confidence is I would just really go all in on my YouTube channel because I love explaining stuff to people um well, you know, I'm a tutor, so you, you better love explaining stuff to people because that's your job, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I really think uh, that would really be the thing that I would do is just really build up my YouTube channel, um, you know, obviously continue to tutor. Um, and yeah, but, you know, it's it really is a confidence thing, I think, because um, really people are, people are capable. And I think an, another aspect of that question too is, Failure is really part of the process. Um, I don't know a single person, myself included, who hasn't accomplished things by failing at them. Because uh, failure is a learning lesson. It's it's a it's a it's a lesson opportunity. Basically, it's mm-hmm. a learning opportunity. I should say. 
Um, and that's how you improve. You fail and then you start failing a little bit less at what you're doing. And that feels good. And then eventually you get to a point where you're like, huh, you know what? I'm only a little bit of a failure. So that means I'm a success, right? Yeah. <laughs> kind of a funny way of looking at it, I guess. But, you know, that's, that's, that's just how life is, you know? Yeah, I think that's a beautiful outlook. And uh, especially the part where you said where kids are just not asking questions in class, like they're, they're afraid of whatever, you know, the culture in the classroom is withholding questions. And uh, that is kind of at odds with getting better at physics. Yeah. And, you know, I'll be the first to admit, I sometimes I'm still like that. Sometimes I think, oh, man, this is such a stupid question. I, I shouldn't ask this because everyone mm. was gonna be like, wow, that guy's really dumb. Like, why, why wouldn't he understand it? But you know, the more as I, the more as I've grown older, the more that I've gone through these classes, I've become much less adverse to asking the quote unquote stupid questions. Like I remember the last class I ever took. I mean, I was just I was asking so many questions and making so many comments. You know, maybe people when they were like, Man, this guy's really dumb. Like, how does he not understand it? But I don't care. You know, <laughs> I've come to a point where I'm like, look, I'm I'm learning this. I care about this. I'm just going to say what's on my mind as long as I think it's relevant or ask a question, you know, if, if I think I need to. Because what I've typically found is that even the, those questions that that students think are stupid, quote unquote, a lot of people actually have them in that mm -hmm. same class. Um, and so you're much better off actually just going ahead and asking that question. So beautiful. Oh, that, that's some great advice. And, uh, speaking of school for you, what was your favorite subject in school? Oh, so high school, I didn't really have like a favorite subject. Um, I had subjects that I preferred more than others. Um, like I definitely gravitated more towards math and physics um surprise surprise right um but i also really like german i took german in high school and that that was really fun um it's kind of really cool and, and i guess I'll, I'll digress into that a little bit it's it's just i guess the reason why i really like learning languages is because it's really cool to see how different people think because you know for example you know in, in spanish like you know if you want to say like you know i'm hungry it's, you know yo tengo hambre Whereas in English, you know, you would say, uh, I am hungry. So there's this mm -hmm. difference of I am versus I have because tener, mm -hmm. you know, which you when you conjugate it as tengo, that's I have. So the, the mm -hmm. Spanish speakers are saying I have hunger, mm -hmm. right? Which you can say in English, but most of the time we say I, I am hungry. So mm -hmm. it's just kind of one of those funny little differences, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, but that's always really fascinating. But yeah, so definitely favorite subjects in school though uh to get back on track um yeah would be german um you know and just like my math and you know when i took physics in high school that was pretty that was cool too so it sounds like you have a love of learning i mean you like languages you like math physics what is the key to having lifelong learning a love of lifelong learning like mm -hmm. that if a parent wanted to give their kid that gift like what are some tangible things that a parent could do the best thing that i can recommend to people is and this really goes for anyone is just try things just try things because you don't really have control over what you like in life you know you, it, it's kind of a, it's almost kind of a passive thing you're like oh i don't know if i like this cuz you, you it's not really a decision you make and so you really have to just go out and try things. And that also kind of goes into people who aren't sure what they want to do with their life. Um, because I, and, and I kind of fell into this trap in, in my early twenties. Like, I don't know. What do, what do, what do I want to do with my life? I, I don't, I don't know. And so I'd spend hours thinking, well, maybe I could do this. Maybe I could do that. But at the end of the day, what I discovered is you really just have to go out and try things. Uh, because when when you go out and try things, there'll be things that you hate. And you know what? You're not going to want to do them anymore. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but the, there, there will be things that you do like to do. And those things you're naturally going to want to do more. 
uh, like for me, uh, you know, making YouTube videos, um, just, I really love to do that. Uh, cause again, I love to explain things to people. I've always kind of been that way. Um, mm -hmm. and so that's, that's an example where, you know, I'm constantly thinking, okay, how can I make this better? What can I do? And, you know, I'll watch videos about making YouTube videos. Um, and, uh, you know, or physics or math or any of my other passions. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's really the best piece of advice that I can give you is if you want to be a lifelong learner, you have to go out and have new experiences and learn about yourself. Cause that's mm -hmm. ultimately kind of when I think about it, that's really actually what lifelong learning is. It's you're, you're learning about the things that you like to do, and then you're going to want to do them more because you like to do them. Right. Yeah, that's great. It's like, just focus on accumulating experiences and the love of it will, will come. The love of learning will just be yeah. like a product of that. Exactly. Exactly. That's awesome. Uh, do you have uh, tips of tips and tricks for learning physics or making physics easier? So there, there, there's a few things that I could really recommend. Um, I would say like, definitely like in, in terms of, in terms of like courses and taking tests, this may be not, not be, this may not be physics specific, but one of the things that I've really found helpful is like, if I'm studying for like a physics test or something like that, what I would always do is even if I wasn't allowed to use a cheat sheet, I would still make one because here's the thing when you, when you're making a cheat sheet, you're essentially having to go over all the material that you that you've gone over and it forces your brain to organize it and because mm. you're spending time organizing it it's going to be a lot fresher when you do take the test um you know so you know i usually do it like you know maybe two or three days before the test and just kind of work on it iteratively just so that way it's all fresh in my mind um the other thing too is what you'll notice is when you are actually making this cheat sheet if you don't understand an equation you're going to find that you're going to have to actually go and do some reading maybe do some problems to try to actually like understand like what your issue is and mm -hmm. so it gives you that little bit of extra practice so mm -hmm. i would definitely say like making a cheat sheet and really making it a good one don't don't just you know don't just, you know, go through the book and just write down all the formulas and scribble them down. Cause you, I mean, eh, it, maybe it'll help, but mm. uh, if you can't use it, that's not going to help you. But what I would definitely recommend is just going through making sure that you understand, um, you know, all the little formulas that mm. you can kind of remember seeing in lecture and stuff like that. And that, and that'll, that'll get you most of the way there. Um, but then maybe that's more of a general advice, maybe not specific to physics. Um, I guess if I could think of something specific to physics, um, <clears throat> if you are thinking about going into physics as a major and you're gonna take your upper level physics courses, one piece of advice that I could definitely recommend to you is get really good at Taylor series because so there's so many times where you're using Taylor series essentially to turn a problem into a simple harmonic oscillator. So simple mm. harmonic oscillator would be another good thing to really know. Mm. Um, that would be probably at least number one in my mind. Um, can't think of too many things off the top of my head, but that would definitely be one of them that's specific to physics. Great. I'm trying to recall what uh, Taylor series is. Um, oh, yeah. So... so yeah, so, so Taylor series is basically you have some function, you assume it's nice, all its derivatives exist. So mm. you can take, you know, infinitely many derivatives of mm. a function. And basically the idea is mm. you can build a power series out of that function. So something mm. like, you know, x minus a to the zero, x mm. minus a to the one, x minus a to the two, where a is mm. the center, a is the point of consideration around which mm. you're constructing the series. And then the coefficients are given by the derivatives of f evaluated uh, at that point a. So your first term would be like the, the function evaluated evaluated at a. Your mm. second term would be the first derivative of f evaluated at a divided by one factorial 
mm. times x minus a to the first, and then so on and so forth. Mm. You just replace one with n, and you build up your, you add up all the terms, and that gives you your series. Right. Okay. Yeah. I think I remember. So Taylor series is like just on that point A or something like that, right? Yeah. It'll yeah. it'll have a radius. It'll have a radius around which it, it actually mm -hmm. converges to the function. And as you add more and more terms, that convergence, assuming f is a really nice function, mm -hmm. uh, you can get you can get you can get it to where once you once you're adding infinitely many terms of that uh, Taylor series, you can actually get convergence to the function. So so there will there will actually be actual functional equality between the two um, for really nice functions, but. Mm -hmm. Typically, you don't need that. You're usually just looking for how can I approximate a function? That's why you really care about Taylor series is how can I approximate a function? So mm. if you have some complicated potential and you want to expand it around an equilibrium point, so basically think a ball on a hill, right? So I have my hill or I have my valley, I should say, and I have my ball in the center of it. If I give it a little kick, it should just going to move that little bit around the potential well that moving back and forth is a simple harmonic oscillator mm -hmm. so you can take some really complicated function maybe beyond this bowl it does all all kinds of crazy wiggles but you don't care because you're only looking at this point in this little valley and so you can get a quadratic approximation of that potential energy and basically you can calculate things like the spring constant um you know the frequency the the frequency of motion stuff like that mm -hmm. and that's a really useful trick in physics because so much of at least what you see in university is okay here's this system in equilibrium what happens if i give it a little kick right and what level of physics is that? Is that second year? So that, so something like that, you would see uh, typically in your upper level of a bachelor's degree. Okay. So a um, little bit more physics specific, um, more so for, and then, well, that's, that's what I was saying. If you, if you are planning to pursue physics as a major, uh, that's definitely something that you're going to see in your upper levels. And so then when you're taking calculus, really make sure that you're really solid on that Taylor series. Awesome. Thank you for going in in depth on how to use Taylor series to solve those those physics questions. Yep. Uh, what's uh, one of uh, your, uh, what's the most important uh, personality trait uh, for uh, some that someone would need to be like a great physics student? Personality, well, um, you definitely need to be humble. Um, physics is not, I mean, for like 99% of people, okay, we're not, I'm not talking about the person with a 300 IQ. Um, you know, those, those are a rare breed. I'm definitely not one of those people. Uh, mm. Absolutely not. Um, yeah, I, you, eventually in and it really actually doesn't even matter how smart you are this is just a general life thing eventually you're going to run into a wall full speed that's going to stop you it doesn't matter how smart you are there's going to be some problem that you're going to run head on first into and it's going to you're going to smack into it like a brick wall and you're going to be like whoa what what just happened there why is this so difficult hmm. um so you really need to learn to be humble, to accept that you're going to be wrong, that you're going to make mistakes and just not get upset about it. Cause you know, I, I used to kind of get upset when, when I'd run into problems like that. And I'd be like, Oh, like, like I'm supposed to be smart. Why can't I, why can't I figure this out? Like now. And, and mm -hmm. it, that, that type of mentality just really doesn't lend itself well to physics because if, if you, maybe you can make it through a physics degree doing that, but you're going to hate it and it's not going to be fun and mm. it's really just not a great way to go throughout life so it's much better to cultivate a sense of okay look i'm going to be wrong it's not a big deal i just need to recognize when i'm wrong and you know try to figure out how to make it right and then mm. and that's really the mm. most 
useful kind of personality trait uh, that you can really develop. And, and I, I had to learn it. I really had to learn it going through my bachelor's mm -hmm. of science and physics. Um, arguably one of the most valuable things that I learned going through my bachelor's degree mm -hmm. in physics um, is, yeah, you're going to be wrong, but it's, it's not a big deal. Like, you know, mm -hmm. the, the world doesn't end just because you made a mistake. Yeah. So suppose I'm going to throw uh, something at you. Like suppose somebody is kind of in that position, like they're frustrated. Um, they, they don't have that like, you know, positive outlook or they just need to have some help. Uh, yeah. what, what do you suggest to them? Do you suggest them to like grab a tutor from, uh, you know, website, uh, tutorocean.com or, you know, maybe write an email to the prof. Like, are, are there any things that you could just suggest to them? Like right off the bat? The very first thing that I would recommend someone in that situation to do is first of all, to just take a break, like just, just take, just take a break. Like if, if you've been at something for so long that you know you're just starting to get frustrated and you're starting to just really let it weigh on your mental state first of all take a break you know it's it's okay like no one, no one's gonna come and be like you're not working are you why aren't you you're still working on this <laughs> you know like no 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 one's gonna do that and then just when when you're when you're in a better place when you've gotten some food when you've taken a nice hot shower when you've enjoyed a nice cup of coffee and or or tea or whatever it is you drink and and you've relaxed and you're in a happy happier place then say okay i have this problem i need to solve now what i can do is i need i need to go and understand where my problem is uh once once you do that and and a lot of times that does involve finding a tutor because someone who's gone through a problem like that can sort of, you know, look at your work and be like, oh, well, so why, 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 why did you do this? Why, why did you do this right here? And then you go and, you know, usually you'll, you'll go, huh, I actually, I don't know why I did that. And I was like, okay, well, let's start there. Um, mm -hmm. So a tutor can be a really helpful diagnostic tool uh, for going through, you know, basically almost like debugging code. Um, it's getting a fresh, not only is it having someone that's more knowledgeable than you on the subject, which is always a help, but it's also a fresh pair of eyes. Um, because when you're doing things, you, you sort of build up this bias as to what you want to do, but what you actually write down, there might be a disconnect between what you write down and what you thought you wrote down. And so then things stop making sense. It, it happens to me all the time. And um, it's, it's definitely something that a fresh pair of eyes can help. Um, but also, you know, if, if you get, if you get a really good tutor, you know, they, they can kind of also just give you a little bit of life advice on this stuff. Um, you know, uh, I, I had to learn it on my own. Um, you know, so I was fortunate that I was able to learn that on my own, mm -hmm. um, just in terms of, you know, I guess, uh, I guess, I guess maybe the British would say, would, would call it keeping a stiff upper lip, you know, not, a mm. not, not letting things, you know, sort of break you down like that mm. um but yeah so i mean having a tutor to sort of help give you confidence you know reassure you be like hey look it's fine you know we're gonna figure this out together um can definitely do a lot of good you know i, I actually I actually have a I actually had a student um that i was tutoring in uh, pdes and her professor was very disorganized, you know, mm -hmm. couldn't even really remember how to do integration by parts and, and all that. And, you know, uh, she came to me and, and it was just, you know, I, I don't know what's going on in this class. And I said, oh, okay. okay. And, and that was you know? partial differential equations class? Right. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and, and basically what I did was, okay, so what's your homework? Let's, let's just, let's take a look at your homework work through it on your own I will also work through it and so what we did then is you know she sent me what she did and then when we actually met I went through and sort of did that diagnostic thing that I was telling you about right mm -hmm. is okay so so you're doing this right here but um so a better path something that's going to make your life a lot easier is going to be doing doing this right and then you know just kind of like going in and explaining it and 
by the end of that because you know um it was a whole ordeal it was a whole experience uh with with that that professor but by the end of it she ended up being ahead of the class because Mm. i was able to actually teach her the subject material you know because you know she would come to me she'd be like okay i tried this but this didn't work and it's like okay okay so you almost got it there but you just missed this one small little detail right here and then, you know, when you explain that, then like, oh, I get it now. Okay, now it makes sense. Mm. And um, yeah, so I think that's, uh, yeah, definitely getting a tutor can really help uh, someone that just has more experience and also has a fresh pair of eyes to look at the problem that you're trying to solve. Mm-hmm. Adam, I read on your Tutor Ocean profile that you got students from getting D's or even failing the class to getting B's or higher. Uh, yes. Why do you uh, enjoy tutoring physics? So a part of it is I, I like to solve the problems. It's, it's always, it's always fun to solve problems. Like, you know, I'll, I'll see, sometimes I'll just be, you know, browsing Reddit or something like that. And, and then I'm looking at the, you know, the physics section and I see a problem and I'm like, I've never tried that problem before. Let's give it a go. All right. This sounds like a fun time, which, you know, I guess maybe some people would be like, yeah, it's kind of weird. It's kind of like solving physics problems, but I mean, well, it's kind of my job, so I better like it, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, But uh, another thing too, though, is just like, like I mentioned earlier, I really have always been the kind of person that once I gain knowledge, I really love to share it. You know, I was always that kind of, you know, Every time I learned something new, you know, and, and uh, you know, I would share with my grandmother, uh, you know, growing up, like, oh, granny, did you know this? Like, uh, you know, <laughs> so um, and then, you know, go into like a 10 minute explanation of it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've, I've always been like that. Um, and so I think just, you know, finding something that I like to do and then my natural tendency to explain to, to like to explain stuff to people really just kind of met in the middle um i mean how i became a tutor was actually a really funny story like i remember i was taking differential equations back uh, in community college and i would work on the homework and, and this guy kind of came to me because you know i would i would answer a lot of the questions in class and so i guess he was like oh you know this guy's no this guy knows what he's talking about um and so you know we started working on the homework together and i'd be like yeah so you know you want to do this almost kind of like a private tutoring session uh, session well, eventually that one guy turned into two and two turned into four and four turned into six. And then before I knew it, I was in the little math center explaining the homework problems to like half the class. Mm. And this, this guy comes up to me after that and he's just like, you know, you should really start charging people for this. <laughs> and you know it was was kind of funny it's like huh well I mean maybe uh but uh so it's it's really just and I you know I didn't charge anyone for it but it's just like I said it's a natural tendency of mine to want to share information so Mm. maybe I mean it's probably just a general human thing I mean Mm -hmm. you know we like to share and communicate right it's kind of why our species got to the the top of the food chain so you know it's teamwork Teamwork makes the dream work. So, I like that. <laughs> uh, what's uh, a common myth about your uh, your job? So, I I think probably. Um, hmm, I don't know. I, don't, I have to really think about that because I haven't. Mm-hmm. I haven't really had like too many like stereotypes uh, about tutors that I've really mm-hmm. seen. But um, let me see here. Um, I guess maybe it would be something like, uh, that's a tough one, man. That's a real tough one. Or maybe you just got, about, got, uh, got me what's a common misconception about physicists? Um, oh, okay. That one, that one, I think would be easier so so physics kind of gets a reputation for like being very esoteric like not Mm. very not very grounded right because you know you read all these stories about like 
oh, you know, CERN, the Higgs boson, it gives mass. Is, is reality even real? Like, what's going, you know, like, there, mm-hmm. there's always kind of like sensational headlines. Um, and, you know, but for me, like, physics is very down to earth. Uh, it, it, it's, it, it's very practical. Uh, you know, for example, right, like, I love to lift weights. Um, and, you know, again, goes back to trying a bunch of different things, right? That's how I found out I like to lift weights was by doing it. Um, but uh, yeah, so physics is definitely very much involved in weightlifting. Um, you have to understand things like torque, uh, you know, center of mass, all, all of these sort of things, because if you don't, and your body kind of understands them on an intuitive level, because uh, you know sort of how you can move right um it's it's sort of like kind of like a the best way that i can think to describe it is a lion actually knows physics very well you may not think that but a lion actually knows physics very well because a lion what a lion can do is it can calculate exactly how it needs to position itself to jump to get a prey right Mm. so it knows physics very well and your body kind of knows physics that well too but when you're lifting weights you kind of have to be aware of positioning because a lot of it is learning the movement Mm -hmm. and that's that's essentially what you're doing is you're teaching your body applied physics when you're you know when when you're doing the movement so a good example of this uh i was squatting and i was doing about 185 pounds and it was really really difficult it was really difficult. I mean, I was really having to grind out that rep. And the thing that I noticed was that my legs were really far apart. And I don't know when that had happened. My body at some point decided, hey, we're going to put the legs really far apart. Have fun. <laughs> your, your body kind of just does stuff without you realizing it. It's kind of it's kind of weird. Um, but anyway, so when I noticed that, then I'm like, okay, well, if my legs are going that way far out, my torso, instead of being nice and upright like this, is really more bent over like that. And so what Mm. that does is that creates a lot more torque on the upper back. Mm. So not only are you having to lift the center of mass of the weight up, but you're also having to fight the torque and erect your back. So your Mm. body is doing a lot more work to lift the same weight. Mm -hmm. Well, once I basically figured that out and I brought my, I brought my stance in a little bit narrower, you know, about a little, little more than shoulder width apart. Now my spine was in a really nice position to where I didn't have to fight the torque to erect my back. So Mm. when I did implement those fix, when I, when I did implement those fixes, and I went to go lift up 185. It was easy. I mean, mm. I just, I mean, the, the, I had so much power coming up. The weight was coming off my back. I actually had to hold the weight down on, on my back. So that, that's a very real world example of physics. Like it's not just esoteric stuff. Mm. Physics is very much involved in real life, everyday real life too. Um, mm-hmm. Well, that's great. I mean, that's a great, great reason to learn physics. I mean, it describes the world around us, right? Yep, exactly. Uh, are there any uh, tools that are really good for uh, for learning physics or for tutoring? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, so a big one that I'm using is YouTube. Mm-hmm. Um, it allows me kind of to explain things, you know, do, do problems that I think are interesting and, you know, just to kind of communicate to potential, you know, wider audience of, Oh, Hey, look, okay. So this is what I'm doing. Maybe somebody, maybe it even helps somebody out. Um, that's, you know, maybe solving a similar problem. They're like, Oh, wow. No. Okay. I, I like the way this guy did this. Okay, cool. Um, and even if, if it doesn't translate into a new client, it's still really nice to know that you're helping people, you know, if they leave a like or something like that, um, it may, may, it makes you feel good. Um, Mm -hmm. definitely tools like, well, you know, like zoom Skype are really helpful, uh, particularly during the pandemic era. Um, it's been really great to be able to still tutor, but, you know, not necessarily worry about, you know, okay, am I going to be spreading COVID-19 or something like that? 
Mm-hmm. Um, and so, and, and it, it's a really good way. And especially with the way gas prices are now. So it, it's really nice to be able to mm-hmm. not have to pay for gas uh, to, you know, cause that's an extra expense. Right. And mm-hmm. it's kind of expensive now. So um, those are definitely some invaluable tools uh, mm-hmm. that I've used. Actually, that brings up an interesting question. How would you compare like physical tutoring and online tutoring? Do you think you could still learn like physics, like all online these days? So I, I, I really, I'm really of the opinion that you can do the learning online. Now, I know a lot of people are going to disagree with that and that's fine. That's okay. Um, but for me, uh, and I can only really speak from my experience, uh, having done, I basically more or less did my master's degree online. And, and the thing is, is that you have to put so much work into something on your own that really the, the physical interaction, I think, is sort of a, a cathartic thing it's just nice to be around people and i definitely agree with that it is nice to be around people i do like going to classes um where there's other people there to have discussions with it is a lot nicer in that way um but in terms of like actually facilitating learning um i think a lot of it is really putting in the work and really my job as a tutor um is to be a guide and I can guide you in person. I can guide you online as well, because ultimately you just need someone to make you feel better about the material. Cause it's not just, again, it's not just about knowing it up here. It's about knowing it, you know, down in here. And part, I, I kind of, I kind of joke sometimes that part of my job is to actually be a counselor too, because a lot of times it's, somebody who has a bunch of other life stressors who you know not only do they have to do good in this class but then they also have to work a job they have they you know they have to you know go out and do all these other things so they're very stressed out and so a lot of it is just being like look everything is going to be fine okay Mm. even if things don't go the way that you want them to life will go on and it's Mm -hmm. only once they kind of get to that position that now they're comfortable and they're going to do better so Mm -hmm. and that's that's something that you you can do online you can do in person maybe the maybe as far on the feeling end it's a bit better in person because then there's that face-to-face connection but i i really think that as long as you're seeing another person's face like if it if it was just some video of a whiteboard right uh you know going through that's probably not going to be as effective as if i had my face on it and i was talking Mm -hmm. you know talking to you like we're having this conversation right now Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. because humans really respond well to other humans face uh faces um you can kind of even see an interesting little thing like that like you know if if you've ever gone into like a, a facebook comment section or whatever you see some truly just vitriolic horrible things that people will say to each other but Mm. if those two people met in real life Mm. they probably wouldn't have said all those things because Mm. there's oh it's actually another human it's not just a wall of text Mm -hmm. right um so i I do think there is something to that face-to-face connection definitely for Mm -hmm. sure um and i mean i could be wrong i could be wrong about the the in-person versus online but i think as long as I think as long as you have just a, some type of interaction with a human, either face to face or voice to voice, you know, it's equally as effective. At least that's what I've found because from my students that I've tutored in person to the students who have tutored online, uh, I didn't really notice any big difference between like, you know, what they were saying. Um, mm-hmm. One final thing though, probably on it is that everyone's a bit different. So, you know, again, your experience maybe, you know, is probably different than mine. Um, So, you know, uh, I guess ultimately I lean towards the online, but, you know, 
I'm happy to be wrong about that. And if someone's really insistent, like, hey, you know, I want to tutor in person, as long as they're not too far away, then it's mm-hmm. like, oh, you know, okay, yeah, we can we can make that work. That's fine. So you've got uh, like a high level of education. You got a master's degree in physics, right? Yes. Or, yeah. Yes. Yeah. A master's degree in physics. I mean, that's incredible. What were some of your study habits? Could you share with us? So a lot of my study habits were I just made sure to start the homework early. Um, and if I felt like the homework wasn't enough, then I would kind of maybe look at the book for additional problems. Um, another strategy that I would implement is, you know, using Google. Uh, you know, you can, you can find problems. You can find other textbooks uh on on the subject that you're learning because really and this is especially true uh, this is especially true in graduate physics um these subjects are so complex that not just one textbook covers them you're really going to be using a lot of different textbooks um and i think that's a good habit for students to delve into is don't just don't just rely on one textbook get you know try to find like at least three or four um Mm -hmm. Like when when I took real analysis, uh, which was probably one of the harder hardest classes that I ever took. Um, yeah, I had like five different books um, because certain books did a good job of explaining, say, the motivation behind something. Other books did a really good job in terms of proof presentation. Uh, you know, um, other books you know, had answers to extra to selected exercises in them. Mm-hmm. So you could actually practice and get feedback. Mm-hmm. Um, so that those would probably be the things that I would say in terms of building study habits is don't rely on a single book when, you know, you, you feel free to use other materials. You know, Google is a very powerful resource if you know how to use it. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other thing that I would say, too, is just, you know, make sure you start the homework early. Don't wait until the last minute to start the homework. Uh, you know, office hours are a good resource. And, you know, even even if you can't, uh, and I know some for a lot of students, it's really difficult to attend office hours. And that's where someone like a tutor could come in, um, mm-hmm. you know, or both, because it never hurts to have more than one perspective on things, right? Like, mm-hmm. You know, when people go to the doctor and, you know, if, if they're, you know, diagnosed with, you know, something serious, you know, you can always get a second opinion. It never hurts. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's the same thing in learning. Right. Multiple opinions do not hurt. Right. Um, so those are really those are really the biggest things that, that I, I did for me in, in any mm-hmm. case. Adam, did you have a tutor? So I actually did not have a tutor. I kind of had to go through uh, everything kind of a little bit uh, on my own. I mean, I did, I did have really wonderful professors though. So that, mm-hmm. that would be the one thing that, that I say, I, I was, I guess I was sort of lucky uh, in that regard. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also had like good friends, um, good friends to, to work with uh, in my undergrad, not too so much in my master's degree. I kind of, for, for, for a little bit of it, I, I sort of had a friend group, but they, they kind of graduated and moved on. And um, so, um, and we also had different interests. So the classes we took were a bit different sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so I actually did not have a tutor, uh, but there are definitely plenty of times where having a tutor would have helped a lot. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um so yeah <laughs> did you ever have a mentor or something like that like somebody who you you uh, confided in or maybe got inspired by um as far as academia goes yeah i mean there there there's definitely like a lot of the physics uh staff at my university that like you know i really definitely look up to um because some really smart people man they're really 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 up there um and yeah, you know, and, and it was always kind of expi- inspiring to look up at them and be like, wow, you know, like, and, you know, these people are so accomplished. Um, <clears throat> got a long way to go if I ever want to be like that. Um, but yeah, so, you know, I, I usually looked up at the physics professors um, a lot. Um, 
it's funny. We actually, uh, <laughs> just a funny story about one of them. We had this, uh, we, we have this, uh, you know, this guy, uh, from the Soviet union, that's where his PhD was from, is from the Soviet union. So way back in the day, um, really, really friendly Russian guy, but man, he, he, he would always just be like very, like, you know, very loud when, whenever he would get excited about teaching and and <laughs> it was really fun like I really enjoyed that like he really mm. brought like a lot of energy to that class mm. and it made it that much more enjoyable um yes. so you know very really really cool guy <laughs> yeah I I completely agree with you I I've I have friends who really got into explaining some stuff in math and I just thought like wow the delivery it's like so good you can't help but learn <laughs> right yeah and i mean and i think that's really like a big thing like in in selling anything is that you really have to care about what you're selling because if you don't i mean well i don't know i mean maybe there are people out there who just they really get into trying to sell people stuff so they don't they may not really care about the product but they're just really excited to sell you something mm -hmm. um i'm definitely not like that uh i definitely need to be excited about what i am trying to mm -hmm. communicate what i am trying to sell people mm -hmm. um you know i have to be a big, big believer in it um because mm -hmm. otherwise it's like eh, well i don't really care about this um adam what can you do with a physics degree well, so uh, on the topic of selling things, um, selling yourself with a physics degree can be a bit challenging, uh, just, just in the sense of it's a very general degree. Again, it sort of suffers from the stereotype of being very esoteric. Um, but so really you can do a lot of different things, but you do have to kind of have some outside domain knowledge, right? Like something like pure physics would probably be good if you're looking to be a tutor right um mm -hmm. cuz then you can teach other people physics or a physics teacher um but if you wanted to say one common one that a lot of my undergrad classmates sort of went into was sort of like financial analyst or something like that um because they got a they they got a decent background in programming Mm. Uh, programming is a really big thing to learn if you're going to be a physics major, because if you know how to program, it opens up a lot of different doors for you because people will look at the physics degree and they'll be like, wow, okay, this person got a degree in physics. Wow. They, okay. They must be smart. You know, that, that's just what people, that's what people assume uh, right off the bat when they see, oh, this person got a degree in physics. Okay. They're smart. They're big brain. Mm. Um, but you also really need to have some technical skills that you can bring to a different job, right? Because just knowing like conservation of momentum or Newton's laws or how to solve the Schrodinger equation for quantum mechanics, you know, these are really nice, simple problems by real life standards. Because uh, in real life, things are nonlinear. There's probably a hundred different variables that are affecting it instead of one or two. Mm -hmm. um, and so you really need to utilize a tool like a computer or something like mm -hmm. that. If you want to implement those skills that you learned in your undergraduate uh, degree into an actual field. Um, so that'd probably be my biggest piece of advice is like mm -hmm. work on some projects that aren't, only just specifically physics related like definitely mm -hmm. get some programming in there maybe you can use programming to solve a really complicated physics problem mm -hmm. but do something like that that would be my biggest piece of advice as to getting a job with a physics degree like you know and what you can do with a physics degree of course alternatively you could become a tutor right um or you could do both you could also learn programming and also you know be a be a tutor and you can also know how to program and you can share that knowledge so hmm. what is physics so physics i would really define physics as it's the study of the natural world it's basically studying how things fundamentally work um and it's a really broad definition of course it's also a really broad question um 
but that's basically kind of what I think of when I think of physics is how does the universe fundamentally behave? Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, there, there's a lot of different things that you could kind of go into, uh, for one, uh, you know, physics is a science. So, you know, all the philosophical implications of it being a science are there as well. Uh, for example, you're going to want to be able to predict things, uh, you know, given some, some measurement, you're going to want to predict future behavior. You're probably going to want to be able to maybe tell something about the past. So sort of looking at things in time is an important feature mm -hmm. of physics. Uh, another important feature of physics is to understand the mechanisms that are going on in that process to create, uh, you know, say like a time series, right? If you have like a time series, you know, data or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's another really important part of physics is understanding the mechanisms. Again, it's the study of how the universe fundamentally behaves. Um, and that, that'd probably be like a general overview of what physics is, at least mm. in my life. And what are the different types of physics? So there's four main branches that you will be exposed to if you do an undergraduate degree in, in physics. Um, if you just do kind of like the, uh, the basic physics that like say an engineer takes, you'll mm -hmm. probably, well, depending on the engineering, of course, uh, you'll probably be exposed to one or two of them. Uh, say like for an electrical engineer, you're probably going to encounter a lower level uh, classical mechanics class, a lower level classical electromagnetism class. And then you'll probably go off and do a bunch of, uh, you know, electromagnetic theory if you're an electrical engineer, uh, mm -hmm. circuits and stuff like that. But if you're doing a full four-year uh, university physics, bachelor's of science in physics degree, uh, you will encounter classical mechanics. Uh, you'll probably end up taking two classical mechanics classes, one, lo one lower, one upper. You will take a lower level ENM and an upper level ENM. You will take a thermodynamics and statistical mechanics class. And you also take a quantum mechanics class. Um, so just briefly touching on what those four are, Classical mechanics is the study of things like, you know, particles and rigid bodies. So you can think maybe like a wrench. If you throw a wrench, it's going to rotate because you're exerting a torque on it. And so in order to conserve angular momentum, it's going to continue to spin. Mm -hmm. um, of course, encountering the air friction, it's going to slow down. And of course, eventually it's going to fall to the ground. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so classical mechanics is the study of things like point particles, and extended bodies and their motion. So think like Newton's laws, you know, car crashes, stuff like that. Um, then you have classical electromagnetism, which is basically now, instead of just a point particle having a mass, now it also has a charge. Mm. So you are basically looking at say like a Coulomb's law, um, sort of uh, repulsion or attraction, you're also studying electric currents uh, and magnetic fields. Um, and, you know, in electrostatics, you study, you know, these sort of static electric fields and magnetostatics, you study these sort of steady state currents. Um, and they're treated as two different things because classical electromagnetism doesn't have the, uh, the infrastructure quite yet to, um, well, actually, I wouldn't say that. You, you can kind of unify, you, you can kind of see that they're, that they're two sides of the same coin, but you, you really need relativity in order to see that. Uh, mm -hmm. The classical electromagnetism, so think, th think of things like electric circuits, um, uh, you know, lightning, right? When, when, you know, when there's lightning in the sky, why does that happen? So that's mm -hmm. sort of what classical electromagnetism deals with. Uh, quantum mechanics is you've got these really small particles, so the mass is really small. So something like an electron. Uh, but instead of just assuming it's a little point particle, you now what you're going to do is you're going to use something called the Schrodinger equation, which is this uh, partial differential equation. Uh, so the math is a little bit more advanced uh, mm -hmm. than something you would see in your under your lower level uh, physics classes. Um, and basically the whole idea behind that is, okay, matter behaves fundamentally differently when it's very low mass. 
Um, and that's sort of where you get this like particle wave duality. So you can kind of think of things like, you know, the double slit experiment where, you know, you, you think you're firing these, you're firing these little uh, electron, um, you know, point particles at this double slit classically you think oh it's going to go through one of them and land on the other side but what you actually find out when you actually measure the um the modulus square of the wave function or when you actually do the experiment i should say is you actually get this interference pattern which looks like a wave was going through two through two of those slits hmm. which is not a particle like behavior particle like mm -hmm. behavior you would expect two sort of bright spots on the you know uh basically behind where the two slits are but what you end up getting is you get you end up getting the sinusoidal interference pattern so there's bright spot in between the two slits one to the right one to the left and so on mm. and so forth right uh mm. which is not what you would expect classically so matter bit so Class, so quantum mechanics is all about the fact that matter behaves differently when you have really, really low mass, right? Hmm. Um, and then finally, there is uh, statistical and thermodynamics. Um, so I should say thermodynamics and statistical mechanics. Uh, so that's basically studying systems with really large number of particles. So you're talking about, you know, something like 10 to the 23 constituent particles. 10 to the 23 is an insanely large number, um, mm -hmm. like a billion, billion, and then, you know, 10,000 more. So it's, 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 it's insanely huge. So that'd be um, one and, with 20 zeros. 10 to yeah, 20. or I think, I, I believe it would be 22 zeros. 22 after zeros. The six or 23. Oh, it's, mm. Yeah, because it's, it's 10 to the 23. Oh, 10 um, to the 23. But, but um so what's it called um i forgot what i was saying oh right so for a system that large like let's say you had 10 to the 23 you know little classical particles now in principle you could apply newton's laws to every single one of those and try to get the equations of motion and to predict the exact state of the system However, in practice, to do something like that, I mean, you would need you would need just this insanely ridiculous amount of computing power, way more than we'll ever have. Mm -hmm. So instead, what you do is you say, okay, I have a really large number of particles. Let's let's make a statistical sort of distribution out of this. And then we can define average properties of that system, like temperature, pressure you know, the volume that the system occupies, although that's not really a statistical thing because, mm -hmm. you know, you can close something in a, you know, like a five liter canister and that's your volume, right? Mm -hmm. um, but you can define these sorts of things. And from that, you can then predict, okay, so, you know, now you can start to describe sort of these macro states of the system, which is sort of like these average these average parameter values and they'll tell you different things about the system uh, like temperature usually not always but for the most part is a measure of the average kinetic energy of the system uh, pressure you're just kind of looking at how many particles are banging against the wall because uh, you know every because you know every little collision right there's 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 a there's a moment there's a change in momentum of that particle mm -hmm. right so there's a force exchange going on there um, and all those little bits add up to where now you actually have air pressure, right? Which if you overinflate a tire, you will definitely feel the effects of, right? <laughs> um, so there's all these different things uh, with that. Um, but in a long winded way, that's basically, that's a basic outlook of the four basic ones that you'll come across of. Mm. Of course, there's, other branches, like I mentioned earlier, when I was talking about unifying the, uh, you know, unifying the electric force and the magnetic force, that's something that special relativity does. Um, when you treat it in that way, um, you you'll actually see in a relativistic way that the electric field and the magnet and the magnetic field are actually really the same thing. They're 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 just two different ways of looking at the same thing. 
mm. um, which is why it's typically called electromagnetism because there's that unification going on but you won't see that until you start talking about special relativity um what else um there well there is an interplay that you'll see in classical electromagnetism but um truly seeing that they're unified takes relativity uh there's also solid state mechanics which is you know basically semiconductors uh, you know, what materials are we going to use for semiconductors? Uh, you know, that's basically how we're having this conversation right now. Uh, well, it's all, it's all physics, but, you know, it's, it's particularly made possible by semiconductors mm -hmm. um, through, you know, all the chips in my computer and your computer. Um, there's quantum field theory, which is very, you know, very up there. Uh, now we're getting into the more esoteric things. Um, <laughs> Uh, well, really, we started doing that when we started talking about relativity. Um, semi uh, um, I'm sorry, solid state mechanics is a little bit more down to earth because it has some, you know, a uh, lot more applications. But even relativity, that's how the GPS works. Uh, you need both general relativistic and special relativistic uh, effects to account for in that. Um, but something like quantum field theory... Uh, so now you're talking about, you know, really making quantum theory relativistic. Um, and there's a whole, I'm not, an, I'm not an expert on that at all. So I don't really know too much about it. Um, but that's a whole thing. And uh, of course, you know, as I mentioned before, general relativity, uh, then there's, of course, there's cosmology. There, there's tons of different ones. There's also fluid mechanics. Uh, which is not treated in a typical bachelor's degree uh, in physics, at least in the U.S., um, which basically involves, instead of rigid bodies, now you have deformable bodies, mm -hmm. which I guess is really more like elastodynamics, not just fluid mechanics. Fluid mechanics is, they're much more separated, but elastodynamics mm -hmm. is, now that wrench is allowed to bend. So what, what happens, right? And uh, you can kind of think of it in terms of uh, tossing a pizza. I don't know. Have you ever, have you ever tossed a pizza before? <laughs> uh, so, I, I kind of tried, but yeah, not like uh, in the movies. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's, it's the, the, the reason, the reason that you throw it up in the air and you're mm. twisting it is because in order to conserve angular momentum, as the pizza expands, mm. right, you'll notice that it slows down. And that's mm. all, all because there's no external torque acting on the pizza dough, mm. right? So the reason that they do that is all down to conservation of angular momentum, right? Because I get it's bigger, so omega has to get smaller, right? That's awesome. So, um, and that's an example of elastodynamics. But yeah, so mm. there, there, there's a lot. I mean, there more there's there's definitely more than what i just out than that i just oh. laid out there but that's just like a brief overview but that was a great breakdown adam i mean you're someone who definitely knows what they're talking about when it comes to math and physics and you give great explanations like the pizza the angular momentum of pizza dough and uh, all that kind of stuff uh, i'm sure a lot of students are going to benefit tremendously from having you as their tutor so I would just like to thank you so much for taking the time to come on Learning Never Stops, the show for you know, parents and, and students to learn about our tutors, learn uh, who they are, and uh, learn a little bit about the subject that they teach. So thank you very much. For sure. It was my pleasure too. Thank you. Thank you.